Pretty nice. So um, what we're going to get into, we've got a lot of demos going on today, and I want Derek to kind of briefly go through, you know, what is this demo environment that we're talking about? Right, and so we're going to be demoing from uh, the MacBook here. It's a 13-inch, nothing super special about it. Um, we've got STS, which is a, uh, an IDE environment for spring development on here. We have something called VMC, which is a command line tool that I'll be using a lot. Um, and then actually we have a full-blown cloud on here too that we'll actually demo in a little while. And so we're going to get started with uh, spring, I think. And then our, our hosted environment, the big cloud uh, that we're going to do a lot of runs against is cloudfoundry.com. It's a hosted environment operated by VMware. We are opening up a managed capacity beta. It's, it's open for business right now. So if you go to www.cloudfoundry.com, you can go ahead and sign up. It's a managed capacity beta. This is, this is the first time we're opening up in a, in a public area. So it's going to be first come, first serve. We're going to drain the, the backlog as fast as we can, but we're going to learn and be safe as, as we grow. So it could take a couple days. It could take a week or so. For you, for you to get in, and, um, of, and of course, as you expect, we're working pretty closely with our vCloud partners. Uh, they're aware of this technology and have been working with us, and so I think you're going to see some really exciting stuff from them too in this area. So we're going to start by talking about the Spring framework. It's one of the three frameworks that we're going to go through today. Um, again, you know, when we when we make a decision to adopt a framework, one of the criteria that we use is is it a safe framework that we can adopt in its full glory. We're not into diluted frameworks. We're not into taking a framework and saying, you can use this 70% subset, but you know what? If you have to call the internet, you got to go, you got to use this other API library. So we kind of believe in your HTTP client. Um, <laughs> full stack integrated tooling. We've got a full staging and auto wiring of services. Um, but, you know, Derek, there's a lot of challenges with, with Java. Uh, the big war files is the one that I that I think of, although I've seen some pretty big uh, job, uh, Ruby bundles too. So Yeah, and what Mark's alluding to is, is that when, when we move into the cloud and we actually deploy an application into the cloud, um, the cloud has no idea what it needs to run your application. You have to tell us everything you need. And there are certain challenges that have transcended between, between Java, uh, Ruby on Rails, and things like Node in terms of package management. And what Mark's alluding to is, is that Java does the right thing for the cloud. It sends you everything. That war file has everything you need to do. Um, the issue then is if I'm on a plane at 30,000 feet and I want to push my 20 meg you know, application, my spring application, that's really painful. So what Mark's talking about is we've actually gone through the pain of making that extremely efficient on a cloud basis such that resources are shared among everyone in a very secure fingerprinted shell one fashion. And you'll see some of that with uh, Romney Boss coming up and starting to talk about but, spring. But the net impact is that you can take, you can take your Java app push it once, and then from then on, all your iterative updates are insanely fast. I mean, you might be pushing 2K on a change out of a 20 meg war file app. So it actually does make cloud development you know, really feasible. We don't have all the debug support that you have locally, but you know, a lot of you guys debug with printf these days because most of the debuggers are in a perpetual state of brokenness. So I we're, think we're getting yeah. there too. And, it, and even more yeah. importantly, if Mark pushes an app that uses a certain version of the Spring Framework, I don't have to do that. And Romney Voss is going to show you that. So why don't we invite yeah. Romney Voss up so to let's, get going. So let's bring uh, Romney Voss, Ladad, and, and Mark Fisher. They're leaders in the Spring community, and they're going to come up and uh, show us some Spring demos. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Derek. Um, Ramnavas, I know you've been working hard creating the optimal experience for Spring developers on Cloud Foundry. Let's take a look. All right. Uh, so, Mark, what would you like to see? Well, I guess we could start with um, jumping right in and, and running a typical Spring app on the cloud. And I guess by typical, you mean travel app, right? Sure. The travel <laughs> okay. app. Uh, most Spring developers are familiar with that. All right. So, let me ask you, Mark. So, if you want to deploy an application from within Spring, what would be your first step? Well, I would need, uh, you're in STS here, so I would assume you need to define a new server instance that represents the cloud. Oh, well, you guessed it right. So here I define a server. So you see there are uh, traditional choices available, uh, TC server included. And we offer one more choice, VMware Cloud Foundry. I need to uh, give my credentials so that I can connect to the cloud. Okay. 
And um, as Mark uh, alluded to, you can have choices of cloud. You can deploy to your local machine. You can deploy to public cloud, private cloud. So in this case, I'm going to choose the cloud hosted by VMware. So I'm going to choose the target of my uh, application. Just to make sure that I didn't fat finger, let me validate the account. It is valid. So I have the server. What do you think is the next step? Well, I would like to be able to just drag and drop the application and have it run. All right, so let's do that. So take the application and drop it over here. So next thing I need to do is I can open the page that represents uh, what's going on in the cloud. So it shows me all the applications and uh, services, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what do you think I should do? Well, the travel application uses a relational database. Oh, yeah. Right. So normally, someone would configure their data source. Um, I assume you need a database All right. So let's, server. let's provision a service. So not just application, but we uh, support services. So in this case, let's me create a database service. And I have choices of service I can choose. So I'm going to choose MySQL, because you need a relational database. Mm -hmm. And I got the database. So I need to bind that database to my application. So the way I do it is I take the service and put it into application services. What, what, do you, what, what, what more I think I should do? Well, I think at this point um, you should start the application. Right. And then maybe we can talk about what you had to change to actually have the Spring configuration recognize this database. Now that you're running a database in the cloud, it's going right. to be different than, than running it on, say, the local TC server instance. So I'm starting the application. Uh, I can give a name. And I can give a URL I want to bind to. So when I deploy application, I want router to be hooked up so that I visit this URL, I should see the application. So then you asked me about, well, what do I need to change? But this was the travel application that I just downloaded off Spring Webflow project. I made zero modifications to it. And I simply deployed it. So we have this notion of frameworks. So frameworks are things like Spring, Rails, Node.js, and we have concept of runtime, okay. Java, Ruby, etc. So when, we, when I push these bits to cloud by saying start button, pressing the start button, I declare that, OK, these are the frameworks that I need to use. And Cloud Foundry took care of binding your original bean, data source bean. Right with the one that comes from uh, services. All right, so let's go to browser and see if I have the application. So I'm just going to reload this page. So this looks like the typical Spring travel application. And you didn't have to change anything in the configuration. And you've probably seen this application a million times. Uh, yeah, probably so. So million and one. <laughs> and there's no change in the configuration? There's absolutely no change. I just downloaded and deployed the application as is. OK, so you're really taking dependency injection to the next level. Exactly. Right? So Spring offers dependency injection. We take advantage of it. And you have no dependency on any underlying infrastructure? APIs no, and you can use all Java that is offered there. So you don't have to have a limited set of APIs cool. to deal with. Cool. OK, so you mentioned that you support different frameworks, not only Spring, but also Grails. A lot of Spring developers are also Grails developers. Can we look at a Grails application running? Yeah, so what I did is um, I already deployed an application. Just let me show you. So this application is another typical application. You've probably seen it, this one also a million times. It's both Spring version and Grails version. This is developed using Grails. And just like Travel App, I took the application off the web and just deployed it, bound a service, and application is there. So let me just reload this, or I'll just maybe click on this link. So this is what's going on here. So in this case, with a Grails application, developers are going to have uh, the, the database is usually configured by Grails itself automatically. They don't think about it. Um, now that they're running in the cloud, they don't have to think about it either. You're going exactly. to detect it. So the experience, so we, we really care about developer experience, and we want to make it as simple as possible to go to cloud. OK. So we have two different applications running now. They're both, you made no change. They're running them as is. If I were to create a new application, what, what would you recommend? If I want to get to the cloud as quickly as possible? Well, one, one way you can uh, go is you can create a Roo application. So you can create a Roo, uh, Roo application. So in this case, let me create a demo app. And so you're able to do this staying within STS the entire exactly, time. Exactly, the integrated the experience. Show. So you create application from within uh, STS. Then you bind services. You configure your application, again, within staying in STS. Right. And then when you deploy to STS, and in fact, you can use it from STS. 
So in this case, I'm not going to go and develop the application. If you wanted, you could go and create persistence entities, right, sure. web artifacts. Specifying I already have deployed application. Let me just show you what's going on here. So this is my contacts application built using uh, Spring Roo. And I created a context DB service and bound it exactly the same way I did it for travel app. Let's visit the URL. OK. So even, even you can st use it application from within right. STS. Right. So at the end of the day, it's just a Spring application that's been generated by Roo. Exactly. Replace the data source. Exactly. So all we really care is what framework it is. So from right. our perspective, Spring Roo is okay. Spring application. OK. And all of these applications are actually using relational databases behind them. Yep. Um, you've got JPA in this case, GORM for the Grails application. I think a lot of developers, though, when they hear cloud, they start thinking of newer technologies. So in addition to or instead of your relational database, you also might want to use a non-relational database, key value store, document store, graph database. Um, also social media, integrating with things like Twitter. And on the Spring team, we've been working on these. We've built Spring Social Project, uh, the Spring Data Projects, covering a wide variety of those. If a developer wants to create one of these applications, what, what would they need to do? Do you have a sample application? Yeah, so let me show the application, and then I will walk you through uh, what this application, uh, what are the technologies behind it. Okay. So we created this application called Stalker. So it literally stalks people. Let me show you the application. Some people in the room. Some people in the room, as a matter of fact. So you have this application, and we have, basically, if I want to monitor certain uh, contacts, what are they up to? So what is Dion doing? Let's just see. So he's talking <laughs> about uh, iOS. Um, so if I want to look at what their activities are, YouTube activities, their blog activities, their Twitter, Twitter uh, uh, feed, I can do it from within application, just sitting there. And we are storing this contacts part in MySQL. So we're using a relational database to store contacts, their YouTube channel and other information. Whereas since we are rate limited by twi uh, Twitter, then we are using Redis to cache the tweets so that we don't overwhelm it. Now let me show you the technology behind it. Yeah, so in the configuration, um, I'll have a data source as usual, but also using the new Spring Data project for Redis support. Right, what, so did, what do we have here? I bound two services, a Redis service, I call it a Stalker Cache, and a MySQL service, which is Stalker DB. Okay. And as far as uh, changes to application is concerned, let me show you. So this is the change I had to make. So I had to, uh, I had to use a cloud Redis connection factory. So if I mm -hmm. want to get access to Redis, then I declare it. What it does is behind the scene is it creates a bean, Spring bean, based on the Redis service I bound. And then once it's a bean, then it's a dependency injection Right. Through and through. Right. So you inject it wherever you want to inject. So this is, if you want to be explicit about the configuration, that you, the particular service you're binding to rather than the auto staging, you can have, in this case, you're using Spring 3.1 profiles as yep. well, right? So I'm using the Spring uh, uh, 3.1 uh, feature uh, being profile. And what it does is it allows you to switch between local development and cloud development without changing your application. So you take the same bits, push it wherever you feel like. All right? OK, so you can drag and drop this application to that TC server instance as well as the cloud. Exactly. OK, great. Well, looks like uh, being a Spring developer, can, you can be a cloud developer as of today, thanks to Cloud Foundry. Yeah, welcome to Cloud Mark. Thank you. So I never really understood what a bean is, but now I got bound beans. So anyway, that was pretty cool. So. Spring the framework. The STS plugin was, was pretty amazing. Uh, Derek, how does that work? Well, uh, again, trying to be open, as, as Rod alluded to, one of the things, uh, the first things we did is how do you talk to this system? What do you actually do to control this system? And there's lots of choices to do that, but at least for us, we thought that going forward, future proofing this, and really kind of paying homage to the open paths that we were trying to do, everything is HTTP and JSON payloads. So everything you're going to see today from the STS plugin to the command line. Is based on an API that's just pure HTTP and JSON payloads. And so what's interesting there is as we made changes to the system, both the STS system and the command lines, and hopefully developers out there in the cloud that want to actually take this and extend it um, can benefit from anything we do there. So no private APIs. It's just using the same API that we can use in, in any environment? Because that kind of goes against my background from Windows. I mean, <laughs> we didn't do that for our shell. Anyway, um, 
So Java, we've seen the safe bet with Java. 